Um, my name is Pete Moore. I'm an associate professor at Case Western Reserve University and director of the Northeast Ohio University Consortium for Middle East Studies. And this year uh, in the Cleveland area and Northeast Ohio, we are sponsoring a speaker series entitled New Perspectives on Muslim and Middle Eastern Societies. And our first speaker, uh, our inaugural speaker in this series is uh, Rami Hori. I'm Rami Khoury. I'm director of the Hassan Faris Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University of Beirut. And I'm also a syndicated columnist and editor-at-large at the Daily Star newspaper in Beirut and a freelance writer. And I do many other things uh, related to events in the Middle East and around the world from my home in Beirut. Great. Um, one, of the, one of the things, Rami, with this, uh, with this speaker series is that it's occurring, obviously, at a very momentous uh, uh, period in Arab and Middle Eastern history. And at the same time, Ohioans and a, a number of Americans are also facing uh, big, big changes. And I think that a lot of people are trying to secure new political grounding in an unsure environment. So I just wanted to see if you might be able to draw any parallels between uh, sort of these issues uh, people in North America face and the people of the Middle East. I think there's probably uh, two important uh, parallels, possibly we call them, or two areas of uh, intersection, possibly, of how people live their lives and deal with the world all around them. One of them has to do with leadership and the quality of leadership and uh, in the Arab world and in the United States, uh, whether it's the local level or, or national level. If you have good, honest, uh, serious leaders who, who address their people uh, clearly and, and, and courageously and tell them what are the problems and what are the solutions and engage people in finding the solutions, then usually the problems get resolved and societies get on with the business of <clears throat> becoming uh, stable and prosperous and, uh, and comfortable and satisfactory for all their citizens. Um, so leadership, I think, is one common uh, issue. And I think in the United States and in the Arab world, we have both had problems with, let's say, very erratic leadership. We've had some very good leaders and some really lousy ones, uh, some honest ones and some dishonest ones, some that are courageous and some that are um, not courageous and uh, afraid to tell the truth to their people. I think the, the second issue really is about how to deal with the world, the interaction between a local society or your own country and the rest of the world. And the world has become so interconnected that you have to really look at global issues, even if you're looking at your own local situation that relates to jobs, it relates to security and uh, terrorism, uh, warfare, um, economic development, all kinds of uh, issues. So I think those are the two areas where I would say ordinary citizens perhaps can understand what others like them are going through around the world. Yeah, I think I think that's a, a nice way of tying it in, and and one of the things that um, I think is is a source of maybe not trouble, but a, a source of frustration and concern is whether or not uh, uh, journalists or academics more broadly, or people that focus on the Arab world and the broader Muslim world, um, did they see these momentous events coming? And so your your first talk uh, is going to be at the Kent State University School of Journalism and Communication on the 4th of October, and the title is, um, you know, Did We Miss It? Uh, academics uh, and Journalism uh, in, the, in the Arab Uprisings. Well, I think it's fair to say that most of the Western press in the Europe and North America and other places did miss the big story in the Middle East now. Uh, and most of the people in the Arab world, I think, who wrote honestly about what was going on in the last 10, 15 years, we're warning against this kind of ultimate uh, mass reaction uh, to a combination of uh, s stresses and problems and uh, uh, inequities that were really uh, bothering people all across the Middle East to the point where they've now erupted in uh, little revolutions, uh, perhaps we can, uh, we can call them. So yes, I think the Western press by and large missed the big story, which was the ordinary people uh, feeling uh, such a combination of pressures and stresses and inequities from three critical sources. And this is what's so important for, I think, Americans to understand. 
the grievances that ordinary Arab citizens have, whether they're in Yemen or in Palestine or in Morocco or Egypt, wherever they may be, there's really three main sources of these problems that they feel they're suffering or this injustice that they're suffering. The first and most important is their own governments, the corrupt uh, police state-like uh, brutal dictatorships in many cases, and in other cases less brutal but autocratic governments where the ordinary citizen didn't have a say. The second source of discomfort was the Arab-Israeli situation with the continued Israeli occupation and colonization of Arab lands and almost total disregard for international law um, and the repeated humiliation and subjugation and occupation and in some cases siege and, siege and starvation as in Gaza in recent years uh, undertaken by Israel against Arab countries with Arabs, of course, fighting back, especially places like Hamas and Hezbollah and Lebanon and, 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 and Palestine. So this is an active war that's going on. Um, and the Arabs uh, have been complaining about this situation for many years with, with very little attention given to it around the world, at least equal attention. Most people in the West taking the Israeli side rather than coming down even-handed between Israelis and Arabs, which is what we would prefer. And the third source of grievance is international uh, politics and Western armies, and particularly the American and British uh, positions and their armies going into Iraq and other places around the world, feeling they can do anything they want. They can torture people. They can send them into rendition. They can uh, basically do anything they want in the name of their own security. And while I think everybody in the Arab world agrees with everybody in the Western world that every citizen should live a secure and peaceful and law-abiding life and not be subjected to terrorism or to dictatorships or to police states. Uh, I think there's huge differences, um, uh, differences in opinion about how people uh, go about achieving that goal. And, and a huge complaint that is so pervasive all across the Middle East and much of Asia um, is the complaint about how the U.S. in particular has led a Western militaristic response to the events of 9-11 and then the last decade uh, has run wild all across the Middle East um, and really hasn't solved most of the problems that it wanted to solve. So it's important to keep in mind those three grievances, the, the local and Arab countries, the Arab-Israeli and the international uh, dimension. And, and it's in that respect that I think the Western press has by and large totally missed the story about why there is such discontent that has been building up uh, all across the Arab world and why it finally exploded in Tunisia in December of 2010. Do you, do you think that they've caught up? Do you think they've done a better job catching up uh, in, 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 in catching up to these events and trying to be sensitive to the complexities? To be fair, I think it's a little bit early to make that judgment, but what I can say with, uh, with, with a lot of confidence, because I follow this very, very closely and I watch this both politically and journalistically, is that the Western media, again, by and large, with a few exceptions, but the, the overwhelming majority of Western media that I've seen, especially in the United States, have refused to accept the uh, three dimensions of that tripartite um, cause of people's discomfort that I mentioned, that the uh, domestic Arab inequities, the Israeli-Arab situation, and Western armies. The Western media has focused on the first one now much more efficiently. They've looked at the Arab world and said, oh my gosh, these kids and these people are demonstrating and they've overthrown regimes and they're fed up with being treated like uh, uh, subjects and being subjugated and, and um, um, uh, led by corrupt dictators. Um, they want their dignity, they want their freedom. The press has focused on that a lot. They have not touched uh, the behavior of Israel and the consequences of the Arab-Israeli conflict, and they certainly haven't at all touched the behavior of the United States and Britain and European powers and others around the region and how they're behaving. So I think there's a little bit of a change, but there, we still have a big problem in uh, the Western media, by and large, taking its cue from American and British and French and other Western governments. That when it comes to foreign affairs, what's fascinating and what I'll talk about at, at Kent State when we discuss media is this same media, let's take the American mainstream media, whoever you want to talk about, the New York Times, Fox, CNN, uh, it doesn't matter, right, left or center, um, the mainstream media does a really good job of covering domestic American affairs. And they do probe beneath the surface. They do go beyond what the government tells them. So when you look at issues of, of race relations, migration, uh, environment, taxation, whatever it may be, you find a very aggressive, professional, dynamic, probing, uh, a courageous uh, media performance by and large in the United States. 
You don't get any of that when it comes to the situation overseas. I mean, you don't get any. You get an occasional story. But for the most part, the American press doesn't behave in the Middle East like it behaves in the United States in terms of its comprehensive, uh, courageous, deep, and nuanced coverage of what is going on. So we still have a problem. Now, whether this is something that's a historical legacy, if, if it's a spillover from Western colonialism and imperialism, whether it's a professional problem that the right. journalists simply are not trained, whether it's a bit of uh, hidden racism and Islamophobia against Arabs and Muslims, we have to discuss these issues together and find out. I think so. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that it'll be interesting to see the response from many of the journalism students uh, at the journalism school at Kent State and to see how they how they respond in, in terms of diagnosing the, you know, what were the shortcomings and the reasons. One of the things you mentioned that sparked my interest is that is mentioning the role of youth uh, in these events and more broadly in life uh, in the Middle East. And uh, for this series, we've been getting a lot of interest from high school students and secondary educators that are interested in not just seeing the speakers, but also um, interested in ways to explore the region more. Uh, and so I just wanted you to, 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 to maybe talk about some of the parallels with the role of youth uh, currently in, in the region. I think it's uh, accurate to say that this current series of uprisings or citizen revolts all across the Arab world that has already changed some governments and is going to change others in the months ahead, that this is largely a manifestation of the discontent among young people that reached a point that was so severe that they couldn't stand it anymore and they just erupted. Um, and of course, uh, they erupted by going out into the streets and demonstrating and then the, and Tunisia and then Egypt and the police tried to beat them up and finally it got to a point where, the, where people of all ages, young and old, Men and women were out in the streets demonstrating, and finally the regimes fell. But So this was a youth-initiated revolt across the region, but it's important to keep in mind, we know this from polling uh, uh, data now, very accurate, comprehensive data from the Gallup polls all across the Arab world in the last three, four years, that the issues that young people complain about are identical to the issues that adults complain about. There is no difference between what young people and what older people over the age hmm. of 25 think. And this is really important. That's the difference... The difference of, uh, between them is that young people will, will go out into the streets. They're less afraid. They're, they're more courageous. They have more to lose because they see a bleak future in front of them in terms of jobs or political rights or citizenship rights. And also this is a biological uh, process. I think I remember in the late 1960s when I was in the United States uh, at college absorbing uh, some of these fine professional values that I've tried to implement uh, all my life and um, uh, seeing the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, the women rights movement, environmental movement, uh, all of these extraordinary social movements in the U.S. in the late 60s, early 70s, mostly led by young people out there in the streets, but reflecting sentiments that were common uh, across society. So it, it's important to understand why is it that young people uh, are feeling discontented across this region, and it's not only a question of jobs and income, it's a question of political uh, rights, of citizenship rights, of feeling that their full humanity is, uh, is appreciated and acknowledged, that they have the right to listen to any kind of music and, and talk and debate and have a, a public discussion about any issue they want. They have the right to hold their government accountable. These political rights and these intangible rights related to human dignity and, and the rights of a citizen, uh, these combined with economic stresses to finally bring people to the point where they just couldn't put up with this uh, depressing situation, which has been going on for two, three decades, uh, and they finally went out into the street. The, the critical point now, of course, is how do you make this transformation? And it's very important to make sure that young people across the region, say people between the ages of 15 and 30, that they are actively involved in the transformation that's taking place now, that there is an active role for them in the councils of governance that are being established, whether it's parliaments or executive branch, presidential systems, uh, judicial systems, watchdog bodies, whatever people are doing in Arab countries now to come up with better governments, that young people must be structurally fitted into the system, not just to have a once a year panel where a couple of young kids are brought to a stage and speak on TV with the first lady or something like that, which is the kind of nonsense that the Arab world has been <laughs> dealing with for the last 30 years. But to have youth structurally involved in the 
deliberations and the decision making. And that is important not just because these young people reflect what their societies feel, but it, but if they feel they're part of the decision making process, they will give all their energy and they will be a tremendous force for productivity and change and, and good things ahead because there's so many of them. They make up like 30% yeah. of society. Yeah, they're very young societies. Um, mm -hmm. And your last, uh, your your second address uh, will be actually at a high school in Cleveland, St. Ignatius uh, High School at the Breen Center there, and that'll be a midday talk. And you're actually going to address these issues. Uh, in terms of the, 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 the title of the talk is The World's Newest uh, Species, uh, Free Democratic uh, and Sovereign Arabs. And so maybe, maybe just to conclude here, could you, could you highlight maybe what you think maybe one of the major consequences uh, of this new type of Arab citizen that we're seeing uh, evolve? The really important and historic development that we're witnessing now, and we will continue to witness this for the next year or two at least, is that entire citizenries, entire populations in different Arab countries are for the first time ever in their history being involved in reconfiguring government systems and structures of power and decision making, whether it's a, a parliament or a presidential system or a local municipal council, whatever it may be. Um, individual men and women in the Arab world now count. They matter in a way that they didn't matter in the last 30, 40 years because the government, the, the security dominated uh, executive branch of government that ran everything in the Arab world um, didn't listen to what their citizens felt. Or, or, or said. Now citizens have a voice. Uh, what they say matters. And if, if, if they don't feel that their voice is being heard and they're taken seriously, they will go back out into the streets and force the power structure to listen to them and negotiate with them. This is what we've seen in Tunisia and Egypt very clearly over the last three, four months, where waves of young people and adults will go back into the streets to demonstrate, to force the prevailing power structure to uh, keep its promises, the promises of the revolutions of January and February, to hold people accountable for corruption, to speed up uh, new constitutions and elections and all the things that were promised. So you have this extraordinary reality of Arab men and women who are free and sovereign and who are actually uh, practicing the rights of citizenship, which is unbelievably exciting. Uh, and it's uh, something that uh, it will take some time for people to... Uh, figure out how do you take that power and transform it into a structure, uh, into a, a configuration of government that is uh, satisfying, but at the same time that works well. We, this is not an idealistic, theoretical, uh, you know, political science class, with all my respect to political science professors, but this is not a theoretical process where you just sit there and, de and design the most ideal government system. You've got an extraordinary pressures of uh, environment, water, jobs, income, security, uh, some uh, ethnic tensions, religious tensions in different places, hangover, uh, anger against foreign governments, uh, problems with Israel still or Iran. There's all kinds of other pressing issues. And at the same time as people are trying to deal with this, all these issues, they're trying to reconfigure and effectively re-legitimize their government system. So this is really hard. Nobody's ever done this before. Uh, uh, so um, dr dramatically in, in, in recent history. I mean, the transformation of the Soviet Union, uh, of South Africa, these are dramatic moments that, uh, that we lived through. But this one is qualitatively uh, different because of the pressing economic uh, problems combined with the political uh, issues and the foreign intervention and the Arab-Israeli dimension. So you've got three or four different dimensions that come together here that you didn't have in the Soviet Union or in South Africa or other places that transformed. Uh, and this is why it's really tough. But, but at the same time, you have this amazing power of 350 million Arab men and women who increasingly feel that they're free, they're sovereign, they really can decide what they want, and they're creating the mechanisms that allow them uh, to do that. This is a win-win for everybody. This is going to be good for the Arabs. Eventually, it'll be good for Arab-Israeli relationships, and hopefully we'll push for a peace process that's fair to both sides. And it's good for relations between the Arabs and uh, and the rest of the world. And, and for people who are focused more on Islamic dimension of things, uh, the majority of Arabs are, are Muslim. 
about uh, 95% of Arabs are Muslims. Uh, so this will have a tremendously positive effect uh, in, um, in reconfiguring relations between Muslim-majority countries and foreign countries. In the same way we've seen Turkey reconfigured in the last 20 years, where Turkey now is a, is sure. a res respected, powerful uh, country that uh, uh, is, is playing its role regionally and internationally. Uh, and so I think that the, uh, things are looking good. Uh, the future is bright, but we've got to get through a really tough transition in the next four or five years. Right. Well, um, we're we're very much looking forward to your uh, to your um, arrival and the, and the events. We have a lot of community support, and our partners are very excited about this. And we're really looking forward to showing you Cleveland. I know you've not been here before, and we're going to see some of the highlights. Uh, so, thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the trip, and uh, we'll see you soon.